Hi, I'm Emily Glankler. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a history teacher who also has a podcast that explains history in silly and funny ways. And for those of you who do know me, welcome back. And these episodes are not going to be anything like that. So like a lot of you have been watching the news, I've been reading about George Floyd. I've been watching the protests in Minneapolis and I've been feeling helpless and sad and outraged. Uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I should do. I know I need to do something. And then I saw on Instagram, of course, a quote from an African-American historian, Lerone Bennett, that said, an educator in a system of oppression is either a revolutionary or an oppressor. And I agree. And so I thought, well, what, what are my gifts? Uh, what can I contribute to this revolution? And my gift is history. I'm able to explain history to people in a way that helps them understand our past. And I have an audience and I have a predominantly white audience that probably needs to hear this more than black people do. So I'm not going to go into any of this in detail. This is in no way meant to be comprehensive or earth shattering. And like, it's not going to be very surprising or interesting to black people who've known this history for their entire lives. But I'm hoping that I can use my voice to speak to other white people who probably have been shielded from this history because it makes us really uncomfortable. So let's talk about a brief history of the relationship between black people and law enforcement. And this is the first in what will probably be a series of videos. The other thing I want to say before I start is that one, you might have noticed that there was an ad before you watched this video. So I am monetizing this video and all the revenue that I make off this video is going to be donated to social justice causes. And I'll post more about exactly where that money's going once I figure it out. And two, you're going to notice that I'm clearly reading and not always looking into the camera. And that's because as much as I do know this history pretty well, I want to make sure I get it right. So sorry. All right. As with all things in American history, it starts with the Constitution. So Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, you've read it, I'm sure, reads, quote, here we go, Old English, okay. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due, quote, oof. Cash. In plain English, that means that slaves are slaves and can't escape slavery, even if they end up in a free state. And that was enshrined in our Constitution. And that's where we start, because law enforcement is meant to enforce the laws. So we need to understand what those laws were. So this clause in our founding document was followed up really quickly by a federal law forcing all authorities in all the states to enforce this law by returning fugitive slaves to their masters. So from the beginning of our country, the job of law enforcement has partly been to keep black people in a system of oppression. Now, as the 19th century went on, the divide between those who supported slavery and those who didn't widened. And in 1842, the Supreme Court passed a ruling that said that authorities actually didn't have to aid in helping find and return fugitive slaves, but they just couldn't obstruct the process. So like they couldn't prevent bounty hunters or other law enforcement from trying to capture their escaped property but they didn't have to do anything to help make it easier for them. And it's kind of like today how sanctuary cities are not obstructing the work of ICE, but they're also not going out of their way to hand over nonviolent, undocumented people to that agency. But like, that's an episode for another day. Now in the 19th century, what was law enforcement? I mean, like most things, it was local and basically unregulated. In the South, in addition to law enforcement, they also had white men that were appointed by local officials to serve as slave patrols. Their singular function was to police enslaved people, and they had sweeping authorities. They could enter any home, seize belongings, search possessions, all with the goal of keeping enslaved black people in their place. And this included white homes suspected of aiding African Americans. So slave patrols were empowered to stop, question, and search any black person on the street in any public place to ensure that they were where they were supposed to be. Sound familiar? Now, the Supreme Court decision did weaken the original Fugitive Slave Act, so a stronger one was passed as part of a larger compromise in Congress. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act forced all officials to help in the effort of capturing escaped slaves. Even in free states, officials who did not arrest an alleged runaway slave were penalized. Law enforcement everywhere was required to arrest people suspected of being a runaway slave, meaning just based on the color of their skin, and also based on really flimsy testimony from their owner. The suspected slave had no way to prove that they were free. Um, they had no legal recourse to argue their case either way. They couldn't ask for a trial by jury. They couldn't testify on their own behalf. 
And so obviously this led to the recapture of many escaped slaves, but also the kidnapping and enslavement of free blacks. Just go watch 12 Years a Slave. So throughout all of this, people resisted. And like the act of escaping slavery was itself one of the strongest forms of resistance. But I also want to talk about other forms and ways that white people got involved and helped. White people across the North began harboring or continued to harbor fugitive slaves, and they protected free blacks. Most famously, right, led by African-American Harriet Tubman, right? She escalated her work on the Underground Railroad, but now they needed to get people all the way to Canada because even the North wasn't safe. White author Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin in response to the Fugitive Slave Act to try to show her mostly white audience of the true horrors of slavery in the South. But at the same time, like, the majority of people in the North were complicit. For one, many Northerners did nothing. They may have personally disagreed with the law or felt sympathy for enslaved people, but if a tree falls in the woods, right? Like, if a white person feels bad about oppression but does nothing, then which side of history are they on? In addition to silent bystanders, many wealthy, many wealthy Northerners and businesses actively supported the law and the system. Although the majority of enslaved people obviously worked in the South, a lot of the financing and the buying and selling of slaves happened up North. Even after the U.S. outlawed the slave trade, Northern business interests were like closely tied to agricultural production in the South. So Northern businessmen founded the Union Safety Committee, which is like an epic euphemism, that raised thousands of dollars to support the Fugitive Slave Act and the continuation of slavery in the South. Okay, but you're thinking like, sure, in the age of slavery, the relationship was clear, right? Law enforcement's job was to enforce laws that kept black people enslaved and kept free blacks in their place. But like Emily, we abolished slavery, right? I mean, kind of. <laughs> but like, actually, we didn't abolish slavery, or at least we didn't in the way that you think we did. So the 13th Amendment reads, quote, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Did you catch it? Except as a punishment for crime. So slavery is still entirely legal in this country if the person is a convicted criminal. And there it is. This is the key, right? This is the key to so much of the turmoil that black people have faced and that white people have ignored. Because after the abolition of slavery and the end of the Civil War, if a white person wanted to keep a black person in his place, all they had to do was find them committing a crime. So when the 13th Amendment was passed, the future governor of Mississippi State Penitentiary said, quote, emancipating the Negroes will require a system of penitentiaries. It's basically a plantation to prison pipeline. So one enslavement was replaced with another. And if you're a little unsure about any of this, like please go read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. So before the Civil War, prisons were pretty sparse and most of them were filled with white men. But after the Civil War, the numbers of black men in prison skyrocketed, especially in the South. And there was this other practice called convict leasing. Prisoners were leased out for the profit of the prison to farms and plantations to do work for free. That's slavery. But you might be thinking, okay, well then those newly freed black people shouldn't commit crimes. But with white supremacists in charge of the justice system, all they had to do was build the laws so that black people would be more likely to commit crimes. Or more simply, just criminalize black behavior. Black codes rose up around the South, making it almost impossible to be black without committing some crime on any given day. For example, in a lot of states, it was illegal for a black person to not have a job. So just get a job, right? So a black person leaving the plantation with no education would look for a job. But then in the town, no one would hire a black person. So now they were breaking the law. They were imprisoned and leased out, sometimes on the very same plantation they had just been freed from. And what about the history of police forces? I mean, just like prisons and justice systems, throughout the first century or so of our country's existence, they were entirely local. There were basically no regulations or requirements for someone to become a police officer, and there was very little training. Remember those slave patrols? Well, when slavery was abolished, they were out of a job. So they often just were incorporated into the police forces. Or if they wanted to be more covert about their racism, they joined the Klan. Does this mean that all Southern police officers in the 19th century were racist? No, of course not. But it does mean that if you were a racist who was angry that black people were now free and you wanted to put them back in their place, you could do that legally by joining the police force. Because again, 
The job of the police is to enforce the laws. So your views on the police depend on whether you think the laws are just. And around the country, they unequivocally were not just for people of color. Even in northern cities, local police departments were overwhelmingly white, and their stated purpose was to respond to disorder, not necessarily crime. They found disorder in really any community that was not acting in a white Protestant way, which means that they spent most of their time in black or immigrant communities. Now, in the South, the laws were clear. In the era of Jim Crow, which I would like to remind you lasted for almost 100 years, laws were passed with the express purpose of oppressing, imprisoning, and disenfranchising black people. When a police officer arrested a black man for attempting to vote without a white person vouching for him, that police officer was just following the law and arresting him. When a black person tried to use a white facility, that police officer was just following the law and arrested them. When a black person was seen in a predominantly white, wealthy part of town, the police officer suspected him of wrongdoing, followed the law, and arrested him. It's important for white people to understand that following the law is not always a signifier of doing the right thing. And when Jim Crow laws didn't go far enough, citizens took justice into their own hands and they murdered black people suspected of committing some crime or just not acting in a way that was deemed appropriate. In the almost 100 years of Jim Crow, almost 5,000 lynchings occurred. 73% of the victims were black and the 27% that were not black were mostly lynched for protesting oppression and for supporting black people. And while the historical records of the mobs involved in lynching people is obviously scarce, from what historians can tell, law enforcement was in some way involved in the vast majority of the time. In some cases, plainclothes police officers actively participated in the lynching. But more often, law enforcement just turned a blind eye when they knew it was going to occur. And it's well documented that those accused of lynching or murdering black people, right, almost never faced any sort of legal repercussion. So it would seem historically that police were somewhat uneven in which laws they chose to enforce and whom they chose to enforce them upon. Now, you can say that we fixed all of that with Dr. King in the 1960s, and in future episodes, I'm going to do my best to show you that that's not true. But it's really critical to understand that we live in a world built in the past. We didn't wipe the slate clean and start over in 1968. We kept going with the same justice system we've had for almost 200 years. And sure, we changed some of the laws, but we didn't change the people enforcing the laws. And we didn't change the centuries-old belief that black men were somehow more violent or more likely to commit crimes because our history and our own actions built that narrative and fulfilled our own prophecy. Our nation has criminalized blackness since 1619, and we've used that myth that black men are criminals to justify a horrifying spectrum of oppressive behavior, from lynching to stop and frisk to moving to the other side of the street when a black man in a hoodie is walking our way, to asking that a black man be more polite in the way he protests his own oppression. To be continued. <laughs>